Good morning. I'm Diego Jaramillo, and I'm going to be talking about imaging of developmental hip dysplasia. Uh, this is an image of a prenatal uh, hip dislocation. You can see uh, here the normal hip and here the uh, acetabulum. Here is the posteriorly dislocated hip regard relative to the acetabulum. We're going to divide this talk uh, in uh, three main sections. One, we're going to talk about articular relationships. Then we're going to talk about vascularity and finally obstacles to reduction. So um, hip dysplasia is a relatively common uh, disorder. The epidemiology is 25 to 50 cases per 1,000 neonates. And of course, it changes geographically. It's much more common in females, more commonly seen in first born children. Interestingly, the left hip is more frequently uh, involved, and 20% uh, of the cases uh, are involved bilaterally. But um, mild dysplasia and instability resolve in nearly 90% of the cases by two months. Um, so in terms of imaging, uh, there are two options. One is the universal screening, which is something that is used in Central Europe because the incidence of developmental dysplasia is so high among the population. Uh, but in the United States, uh, we use uh, ultrasound for high risk or abnormal exam. In terms of risk factors, um, we um, worry about breach presentation, so that's an indication to do an ultrasound. Um, we worry about, of course, the female gender, intermediate family history, and but the majority of hip dysplasias don't have a real cause. So let's talk about the articular relationships. This is uh, uh, an image to um, match with the specimen from the work of Milgram, where you can have here the um, femoral head, the greater trochanter, and the ossification center. But what we are going to see on ultrasound is an image like this. This is a coronal image where we see the uh, ossification center, the femoral metaphysis, uh, the greater trochanter in the acetabular rim. And uh, another image of the coronal view, and uh, we can see here uh, the acetabular roof uh, over here as a number two, and uh, the iliac wing as the number one. And it's important that the line through the iliac wing should bisect the femoral head. This is called the equator sign. Um, and this is, uh, the, the two lines form the alpha angle, which should be 60 degrees or more. Uh, on the transverse view, um, the transverse view, I'm going, I'm going to show a CT scan to orient, uh, you. And, uh, here we have anterior, here we have posterior. This, uh, is, uh, the pubis and this is the ischium and here is the femoral head. If we turn it around 90 degrees, we get an image like this. This is anterior, this is posterior, and <clears throat> that is the image that we're going to have on the ultrasound, where um, here is the ischium, so it would be this. Here is the femoral head, which would be here. And in this case, this is uh, flexed, so you have the femoral uh, shaft uh, uh, obscuring the view of the pubic bone. Um, in this case, we've uh, used a stress view uh, where uh, we've pushed uh, the uh, femoral head posteriorly to see if there is instability. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, an image in extension, which is similar to the one of the CT I showed you. So again, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the pubis, this is the ischium, and uh, the femoral head should be nicely seated on the, uh, uh, on the hip concavity. And this is transverse inflection, where you have uh, here the femoral shaft, here is the femoral head, here is the uh, cartilaginous posterior acetabulum, and again, it should be nicely seated. Uh, and uh, here is uh, two images from a dynamic study, where um, we're doing a Barlow maneuver, um, doing adduction and pushing back uh, in more than five millimeters of uh, movement posteriorly is considered abnormal. 
The alpha angle, as I mentioned, should be about 60 degrees in the normal coronal plane. Uh, here we have a dysplastic uh, uh, angle, which is much uh, more acute. And uh, notice also that this acetabular rim is less well defined. I'll show you more examples of that. This is a subluxed uh, case where, again, a very acute alpha angle. You can see that the femoral head is uh, not bisected by the line through the iliac wing, uh, but uh, rather the femoral head is partially out. And uh, the acetabular rim is poorly defined, which is a very good uh, indication of hip dis dysplasia. Um, and this is compared to the normal side on the contralateral side. And uh, here uh, we have uh, a, a patient in, in harness. So in harness, when the patient is, is treated in an abduction harness, uh, we don't do the dynamic part of the examination. Uh, we uh, just uh, image uh, the patient to see if the hip is well located. You can see here that the head is a little bit out. There is an echogenic material in the depth of the acetabulum, which is the pulvinar. So the, the femoral head is a little bit out. The labrum is a little bit echogenic. And uh, you can see it in flexion again, um, relatively well seated, but here is the pulvinar uh, pushing the femoral head out. This is severe dysplasia where you have very poorly defined acetabular rim, a very echogenic labrum. There is an echogenic pulvinar, um, all of which are contributing to the femoral head being out of the acetabulum. So in this case, this is subluxed. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the iliac wing uh, line does not bisect the femoral head. The labrum is hyperechoic. Uh, the acetabulum is less concave, and there is a rounded acetabular rim in the pulvinar. Um, this is a patient that was evaluated for abdominal pain. And we usually do not use plain films, um, plain radiographs under six months of age because uh, we're, uh, the, the way to evaluate hip dysplasia in the first six months is by ultrasound, but it is important to be familiar with the findings of hip dislocation. And you can see here that uh, the femoral head is not where it's supposed to be. If you imagine the femoral head, it should be somewhere here. And the femoral head is articulating with a little concavity in the iliac wing, which is the pseudoacetabulum. On the other side, same thing. Um, people study a lot the lines of the Hilgen-Reiner, the uh, Perkins line, etc. And I would say that those uh, lines are not as important anymore because we do not evaluate hip dysplasia with plain radiographs. But if you trace a line through the lateral aspect of the acetabulum, definitely the femoral head should be inside. And in this case, on both sides, the hips are dislocated. So. When we uh, look at the uh, ultrasound, you can see that there is no relationship between the femoral head, both on the right and on the left, and the acetabular concavity, so it's bilateral hip dislocation. Now, should we do ultrasound on all patients? And there, there have been great studies in Norway uh, looking at uh, what uh, happens when uh, you do ultrasound on patients. And um, it's clearly seen that if we were to do ultrasound on all infants, we would have increased rates of treatment and no change in the rate of late detected dysplasia or surgery. So in general, um, it is uh, worthwhile to um, plan in advance uh, to detect or to, to see whether you're going to do an ultrasound or not. Um, so how do you treat developmental dysplasia of the hip? Well, we treat it by abduction, and the reason is that the Acetabulum is a very plastic structure, and if the head, if the femoral head is inside the acetabulum, it is going to reform well. Normally, uh, in cases of not very severe hip dysplasia, there is the pavlic harness or a variety of other harnesses which allow motion, but in very severe hip dysplasia, we have to use uh, these spica casts which keep the head in severe abduction. Spica casts are, have a risk of developing uh, avascular necrosis in some uh, series up to 20%. And the reason is that 
um, as you see in this diagram, you want to have the head in abduction so that it's in and reforms the acetabulum um, in what is called the safe zone. If you have less abduction, you're going to have a risk of redislocation. If you have more abduction, you're going to have a vascular necrosis. And unfortunately, this safe zone varies from patient to patient, and it's impossible to know whether the patient is going to develop a vascular necrosis without doing imaging. In order to see how we can see vascularity of the femoral head, we have to look at the uh, vascularity of the proximal femur. And uh, this is a T1 without gadolinium. This is T1 with gadolinium. You can see here the multiple vascular canals within the femoral head, which you can see here on an injected specimen. <clears throat> Interestingly, the, the, uh, within the cartilage, uh, you don't have a capillary network, the rather the, va the vessels go within these vascular canals that you can see an ultrasound, that you can see post catalinium, uh, and these are tubules within which the um, vessels course. If you see flow within these canals, that's an indication that, that there is perfusion of the femoral head. So these are the epiphyseal vascular canals. You can see them here histologically. Again, tubules within which vessels course. Um, you can see them with ultrasound as well. You can see multiple vessels after um, the with, with Doppler, um, either color or power Doppler. For the most part, we've been talking about ultrasound, which is the mainstay of the evaluation of hip dysplasia. So when do we use MRI? Well, the first is to look at the position of the femoral head after reduction in cases of severe hip dislocation. And you can use any sequence for this. Typically, T2-weighted or protein density-weighted images are the best. Um, you can evaluate femoral head perfusion after reduction and placement in a spica cast for which you need gadolinium. Or, and also, you can use MRI to evaluate obstacles to reduction, which you can see uh, on the axial and coronal T2-weighted images. Um, this is, uh, these are some examples of evaluation of hip perfusion. So this is a patient that was placed in a spica cast. These are two axial images from the same patient. <clears throat> you can see that both hips are in maximal abduction. And notice that um, if uh, you look at uh, each one of the femoral heads, you can see multiple vascular canals uh, indicating that uh, the femoral head is well perfused. Also notice that the femoral head is in the acetabulum even, even though it's not perfectly seated because the patient has hip dysplasia. Notice, incidentally, this is a fat suppressed image and uh, there is a fatty structure called the pulvinar which is uh, sitting within the uh, acetabulum and is interfering with reduction. This fat is something that develops when the hip has been out for a little bit in it is a relatively passive structure in that once the femoral head is in, the pulvinar goes away. Um, now contrast that with this patient um, in which, uh, be, you know, after gadolinium, you can see normal uh, vascular canals on this side. On the regular imaging, you don't, uh, you're not sure really if you see normal vascular canals, but on the subtraction image, you can see that the femoral head is very black. Similarly, on the coronal image, notice the normal vascular canals and then the cartilage, which has less signal intensity and you, you cannot see the vascular canals. Um, another case, again, showing the value of subtraction, this is pre-gadolinium. Uh, in post gadolinium subtraction, notice that on the normal side you see the enhancement of the ossification center. On the abnormal side, there is no ossification center enhancing. Uh, and again, this is the dark ossification center uh, in the non-subtracted images after gadolinium. This is a, another case, very dramatic. Uh, this case has a normal hip on the right, an abnormal hip on the left with a poorly developed ossification center. And uh, this is the subtraction image after gadolinium. Notice that there's normal enhancement of the femoral head. You can see a few uh, epiphyseal vascular canals. On the um, ischemic side, you can see no ossification center enhancing, and you do not see any uh, vascular canals at all.
So uh, this is the value of, su of subtraction. Uh, another case, uh, again, no vascular canals because of ischemia. Um, but, uh, but one thing that is important is that if you have global ischemia like this, this is very significant. If you have just patchy areas of decreased enhancement, this has proven to be non-significant with time. Another case uh, of uh, global dysplasia, global absence of perfusion. The third uh, issue are, is the evaluation of the obstacles to reduction. So in complex hip dis dislocation, um, when you bring the hip back into the acetabulum, you are going to have structures that might get in the way of the femoral head coming back into the acetabulum. And one of them is, as I mentioned, the pulvinar, a fibro fatty cushion that develops when the hip is out. And as I mentioned, once the hip comes back in, uh, then uh, the uh, pulvinar kind of melts away. Uh, you can have a redundant capsule that can, like uh, producing an infolding uh, that can get in the way uh, of the reduction. You can have a large ligamentum teres, as shown in this image from a radiographics article by Dr. Rosenbaum, and, um, you, and this uh, uh, ligamentum teres is also going to fill the acetabulum. You can have an abnormality in the contour of the um, acetabulum with a ridge called the limbus. You can have an inverted labrum like you, you see in this case with the L, or you can have an interposed psoas tendon. The psoas tendon gets in the way, uh, gets in between the femoral head and the acetabulum when the femoral head is out. And uh, again, it can create an hourglass configuration of the acetabulum. So let's see some examples. This is a patient with a normal hip <clears throat> on the right side. Notice that you can see a nice uh, configuration of the acetabulum that looks like a, norm a normal eyebrow. Notice that in this case, the acetabulum is much smaller, much more vertical and uh, not as concave. And the femoral head does not articulate with the acetabulum. Also notice the hip is not ossified compared to the normal side that, that is ossified. So delay in ossification, lack of articulation, poor development of the acetabulum, all radiographic findings of hip dysplasia, and in this case of dislocation. So um, uh, in this case, the uh, hip was reduced and um, the femoral head was placed in the acetabulum. You can see here um, the femoral head does not articulate on the left side as well as it does on the right, where there is a tight contact between the acetabulum and the femoral head. But there is, uh, but but it, it it is more or less located. But notice that uh, there is this fatty structure in the depth of the acetabulum, which is the pulmonar. Um, you can see it on fat suppressed images as an area that is very dark. Um, in this case, uh, you can see again uh, a, a very well-developed pulmonar again getting uh, in the way of the femoral head. Uh, compare that with the normal articulation. Um, another um, obstacle to reduction is the acetabular deformity that you get. Uh, here you can see the so-called limbus where you have like a ridge in the acetabulum and sometimes the femoral head can be out outside. And uh, if you look at the capsule also, you can see here the capsule being redundant and the capsule sometimes can form an infolding that can get in the way of the uh, reduction. So here is the capsule infolding. Uh, another case of an infolded capsule, here you have the femoral head, here you have a capsule that is redundant, getting in the way, and interfering in the process of the femoral head coming into the acetabulum. Um, here we have uh, a pulvinar, here you have a little ridge in the acetabulum, the so-called limbus, a prominent ligamentum teres on this uh, arthrogram. Um, and all these things are going to be interfering with reduction. Hypertrophy of the ligamentum teres, um, as I shown you, this is a, an image where contrast material has been injected into the joint and notice this structure here, this is a ligamentum teres that is very fat and is uh, in keeping the femoral head outside of the acetabulum. And again, this patient had a pulvinar, 
Um, here is an inverted labrum. The labrum normally is a little triangular structure, which is um, fibrocartilaginous and should be nicely seated on top of the femoral head. In this case, it is inverted and keeping the labrum away. Um, and uh, here is that uh, limbus, that ridge in the uh, femoral head, again, keeping the femoral head from getting into the depth of the acetabulum. Uh, here is the limbus by MRI. And uh, finally, this is the interposed psoas tendon. Again, the psoas tendon getting uh, interposing itself between the femoral head and the acetabulum. Here is the psoas tendon. Here is the empty acetabulum. Here is the femoral head. Um, so in terms of take-home points, um, ultrasound imaging is the mainstay of imaging under six months of age. Um, and it should be done on infants with uh, risk factors or with uh, an abnormal exam. Uh, coronal images on the ultrasound are going to be used primarily for evaluation of the morphology, whereas the axial imaging is done primarily for dynamic imaging where we're looking for laxity. MRI is done in complex cases after you have to do um, reduction in placement of the spine into the spica cast, and you look at it for assessment of the reduction, for assessment of perfusion in patients who are hyperabducted in spica cast, and finally for obstacles to reduction. Thank you.